So today I'm going to talk a bit about the contemporary uh, evidence for fluid bolus therapy in the intensive care unit. And my interest really started during a long, hot Scottish summer where I was working as a registrar in the intensive care unit in Glasgow. And much of my job seemed to be administering fluid boluses to patients in a variety of situations. And I have to admit that I was somewhat unimpressed with the results. So I started to read some papers. I read some papers about albumin and some papers about furosemide and some papers about the kidney. And they all seem to relate back to this gentleman here. And after a couple of phone calls and a few emails, I was convinced to come to Australia. Now, much of my understanding of Australia had been formed by home and away. And so <laughs> I certainly had some expectations of what was going to happen. But it turned out really that not very much had changed at all after I got here. And unfortunately, it's the same for fluid bolus therapy. Um, there's a brilliant paper from 1832 um, in The Lancet where fluid bolus therapy is first described. So there was a lady who was suffering from advanced cholera. And after she received intravenous, a weak intravenous saline solution, um, her condition was amazingly ameliorated. There was a fine glow and a slight perspiration on her face. And the veins on the backs of her hands were well filled. The restlessness was removed and her pulse was under 100 and full and free and soft. This is an astonishing method of medication and I predict it will lead to wonderful changes and improvements in the practice of medicine. But to produce the effect intended, a large quantity must be injected from five to 10 pounds in an adult and repeated at longer or shorter intervals as the state of the pulse and other symptoms may indicate. Now this was pretty much exactly what I was doing in Glasgow um, 200 years later which made me think that there must have been an evolving body of evidence to say that this was the right thing to do. But despite the work of Max Harry Veal and Shoemaker in the, pre, in the following uh, 100 years, sorry, in the following so 150 years, we still had um, no we still had no studies which um, had adequate controls. We had no studies which compared fluid bolus therapy with vasoconstrictors. We had no studies which compared fluid bolus therapy with, vaso with other vasoactive medications. And we had no true assessment of the effects of fluid bolus therapy beyond 60 minutes after administration. In 2012, the latest edition of the Surviving Sepsis Guidelines were released. And they recommend that we give a 30 mil per kilogram bolus of crystalloid to patients who we think have sepsis-induced tissue hypoperfusion. They make strong recommendations, but there's no level one evidence attaching improved outcome from fluid bolus therapy. And yet over 10,000 hospitals are now compliant with the surviving sepsis guidelines across the world. Much of the much of the um, guidelines are based on the work of Emmanuel Rivers, which, as we're all familiar with, showed an improvement in mortality in patients who were treated with early goal-directed therapy. And in this study, patients might have had a pre-inclusion fluid challenge of 20 to 30 mils per kilo. They were given 500 mils of crystalloid over 30 minutes as part of the resuscitation algorithm to, as I'm sure those of you who listened to Professor Singer's talk yesterday will realise, to an unsubstantiated hemodynamic target of a CVP of 8 to 12. And fluid was given as part of a complex suite of um, interventions, including the administration of blood, vasopressor, and inotropic medication. Over the last 10 years, there's been an evolving body of work which has demonstrated in critically ill patients and in others that there's an association with fluid accumulation and worsening outcome. So we reviewed the contemporary literature, and by that I mean literature from 2010 to the end of 2013, um, for papers which um, looked both at uh, in septic patients who were receiving some form of fluid bolus therapy. And we included, so we reviewed 3,000 um, studies, but only 81 um, publications we thought were possible for inclusion. 33 of those publications described fluid bolus therapy, but only 17 actually described the, the subsequent physiological effects of fluid bolus therapy. And only seven discussed patient-orientated outcomes. 
of the studies that we identified, 28 were quasi-experimental or observational, and only five were randomized controlled trials. No randomized controlled trials compared fluid bolus therapy with an alternative intervention. Two actually reported the impact of blood volume analysis on protocolized resuscitation. Two compared hypertonic and isotonic fluids, and one actually compared two different vasopressors. Across these 33 studies, 41 different forms of fluid bolus therapy were described, but the most commonly used fluid was saline. The median volume administered was 500 mils, and that was administered over a median period of 30 minutes. And as we can see, at 60 minutes after fluid administration, the clinical changes in the patients in a small number of studies, because that is the number that reported data to 60 minutes, could be considered clinically negligible. And when, uh, when we look beyond 60 minutes, only a single study reported figures. Um, and as we can see from the graphs, pretty much what happens is a bit chaotic and of potentially limited clinical relevance. We demonstrated that there is significant heterogeneity of the triggers for fluid bolus therapy, the amount delivered, the fluid choice, and the speed of delivery of fluid bolus therapy. The physiological targets of fluid bolus therapy are heterogeneous, as are the physiological changes that are experienced subsequent to its administration. There are no randomized control trials of fluid bolus therapy recently versus an alternative intervention, and there's no study relating physiological changes after fluid bolus therapy to clinically relevant outcomes. So we actually wanted to know what we did here in Australia, and we carried out an electronic survey of self-reported practice among consultants who were attached to one of the ANZIC CTG member intensive care units. We got 177 responses, and we had responses from every area of Australia and New Zealand. And in Australia and New Zealand, the prototypical fluid bolus is at least 250 mils of um, Ringer's lactate, um, or 4% albumin, given in less than 30 minutes. And we also found that self-reported fluid bolus therapy practice in Australia and New Zealand varies widely regarding the type, the volume, and the rate of administration of the fluid. We also examined um, clinicians' expectations of fluid bolus therapy. And more than 30% of respondents felt that the mean arterial pressure following fluid bolus therapy had to increase by more than 10 millimetres of mercury to constitute a response. More than 60% of respondents felt that heart rate had to drop by at least 10 beats per minute to constitute a response. And there was no consistent um, signal as to how the urine output should change to constitute a response to bolus fluid therapy. However, CVP, um, with CVP, about 30% of respondents felt that it should increase by more than four millimetres of mercury. To summarise what we know at the minute, we know that fluid bolus therapy is ubiquitous. We know that in the contemporary literature, fluid bolus therapy is poorly described in severe sepsis and septic shock. And we also know that it's a chaotic intervention, and it's one that the people delivering the intervention have uncertain expectations of. We know that there's a paucity of level one data associating fluid bolus therapy with patient-centered outcomes. And we know that there's no evidence comparing fluid bolus therapy to alternative interventions. We know that there's no evidence relating the physiological changes um, subsequent to fluid bolus therapy to patient-centered outcomes. And we know that there is no international data on what people say that they do. And that's really important because fluids are drugs, like anything else, and that we give in intensive care. And we wouldn't give any other form of drug without tailoring it to the patient that we're delivering it to. So fluid boluses really have to be a specific fluid at a discrete volume, given over a defined period of time, to a desired effect, taking into account um, an individual patient's background, comorbidities, and underlying pathology. When we're giving fluid boluses uh, as therapy, we have to actually work out when it's appropriate to give them. I don't think that that evidence exists yet. 
We also have to work out what the appropriate physiological or other endpoints for administration of fluid boluses are, and not just to physiological targets, but to targets that are clearly associated with an improvement in patient-centred outcomes. And so, to conclude, I would say that prospective studies to document the actual physiological response to appropriately defined fluid bolus therapy and comparators are both urgent and necessary. Any questions?